Lord, I pray that you would work in our minds to renew them today as we explore your word. Renew it after your will. Renew it according to your ways. That our lives might be living epistles for others to read and see you. Not us, but see you. And touch this vessel, Lord, that it might deliver it as you would have it delivered. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's turn in our scriptures, apps, or the like. In my case, notes today. To Philippians. Philippians, first chapter. Starting at the second half of verse 18. To verse 21. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. This will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I was looking at this passage, I was once again reminded of the rich young ruler of Luke 18 and Matthew 19, who came to Jesus and wanted eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, If you are going to inherit eternal life, you're going to have to re, you're going to have to shift the center of your life from where it is now to me. And the way you're going to have to do it is you're going to have to sell all of your riches, give, it to the, give them to the poor, and follow me. Not the investment banker to the poor and follow me. The man dropped his head and, and walked away. What was Christ doing? He was calling this young man to himself that he might be this young man's all in all. But he was too attached to his earthly life to be able to make that shift as his center. Paul, on the other hand, had the equivalent of two PhDs by the time he was in his mid-twenties and had a promising career, let's just say, out the wazoo, right? And what did he do? He walked away from all of it to follow Jesus. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. Paul's heart, as it is exemplified in this passage in Philippians, we'll be looking at what I'm calling a four-unit message. All right, his deliverance, the discussion about his deliverance, his heart, and why his heart was the way it was, and what the opposite hearts look like. That is four parts, believe it or not. Okay. We begin this passage with the reality of his rejoicing. He says, I will continue to rejoice. Why was he rejoicing? Because he had the assurance that his, that his adversities, the imprisonment, his enemies, and actually he had a forthcoming trial. That's why he was in prison. And that trial could go one way or the other. But he was rejoicing because he said all of it was going to turn out for his deliverance or his salvation. The word translated deliverance there is both deliverance and the word for salvation. Now, firstly, what was this deliverance he was trying to, uh, or he was calling for, he was praying for, or hoping for? What was this deliverance? Was it strictly 
the physical release from prison or was it something a little more ultimate than just getting out of jail? Now, this is important because we have in our culture today a theology that focuses on just that one aspect of deliverance. In this case, physical deliverance. Some people call it the health and wealth gospel. Uh, people that are in it refer to it as the word of faith. It is the notion that by God's power we can get health, wealth, success, power, favor, protection, and goes on and on. And in this particular example, the only deliverance that you really ought to be looking for is the one that Peter got in Acts 12. And that was an actual jailbreak. I mean, the angel goes in, yanks him up. He was asleep. But the angel goes in and goes, <clears throat> he wakes up. He, 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 he don't know what's going on. Come on, let's go. You know, he just stumbles out of there. Next thing you know, he's outside in prison. Oh, okay. So he goes on to the house where the folks are praying for him to get out of prison. And one of the little girls... I bet it was, it was either Lila or Eden, one of them two. <laughs> Looked out the window and said, uh, I think he's here. And ran open, opened the door and ran back in and said, he's there, he's there, he's there, he's there. You know, can, can you just see uh, 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 Eden and, and, and Eli, you know, together, just like doing this? <laughs> and everybody said, we're praying for Peter to get delivered. He, he's at the door. And then they finally went to the door and there he was. If you're oriented to a word of faith mindset, that is deliverance, period. So you're thinking, that ought to be what Paul is praying for. There is one problem with that conclusion. Paul says... He wants Christ to be glorified whether by life or by death. Whoops. Because you see, if he dies, that's a failure of deliverance. Like someone who dies and doesn't get healed by faith. So Paul is looking at a much greater deliverance than just deliverance in this life. Let's, let's look at, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians 4. He kind of reveals to us his perspective. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary, here today, gone tomorrow. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Hallelujah. Now that's where Paul was at. However that deliverance came, whether that deliverance came because he got out of jail or deliverance came because he went on to, be, to glory. Whether in life or in death, he wants Christ to be glorified. So hoping, even expecting, when the pressure was on, he didn't want to be ashamed, but to have sufficient courage to face whatever would come his way so that Christ would be glorified. That was his perspective. Now, he is a part of that, I would call, you you might say, a tradition, a perspective that we also see way back in Daniel 3. When the three Hebrew boys were standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar's, you know, uh, entourage, the guys that were, you know, doing his bidding, was commanding everyone to bow down to this image that he set up. And looked at the three guys who were actually government officials, and he said, mm -hmm, okay, are you going to bow? You know, let's get this on. And they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Be advised. But if not, but 
If not, it be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We ain't doing it. We don't care which way this goes. We're not bowing. And of course, everybody got, what? You know, and the, and the race was on. And, uh, you know, I'll let you all go back and look at Daniel 3 and you'll see what happened. If you don't already know. All right? All right. Now, Paul's not trying to do this thing by himself. He's also calling for support. So he's asking the Philippians to pray because that's all part of it. So when we pray for each other, that's not something new to us. That's something that has gone on ever since the beginning. It is the pattern of scripture that we pray for one another. The body of Christ prays for those that are out there in the field. That the Lord, that the body of Christ prays for those that are having difficulties. As we are praying for Sister Lillian right now for her healing. Uh, he would pray, they would ask him to pray for things like that he would be delivered. That he would have courage not to be ashamed. That Christ would be glorified whether he was set free or whether he was executed. These were prayer requests to the people of Philippi for him. And of course he stated, you know, I am looking for the help and the supply of the Holy Spirit which he calls the spirit of Christ. You know, and for those that at that time wanted to see the spirit as something disconnected from Christ, he wants it make, wants it make, it make sure everybody knows that this is the spirit of Christ. It is that mystery of the Trinity, how they are both one and three persons spoken of here at this point. And then Paul at the end of this passage states his heart. For, to, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So we see that heart reflected in his goals and in his attitude. The previous passage we looked at. Christ, he said, Christ is preached even though some people are in it for themselves or trying to make my life miserable. It's okay. Because Christ is preached. And now in this passage he's just saying Christ is glorified in my body as I pray for courage not to be ashamed. And I rejoice and I'm hopeful about my future whether I live or whether I die. I'm hopeful. Because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if you step back and look at that, you might think to yourself, is he so heavenly minded that he is earthly no good? Is he psychologically obsessed with Christ to the point that it's unhealthy? I mean, he doesn't care if he lives or dies. What's up with that? Is Paul just being over the top? In his attitude. Maybe somebody should sit down and, and, and talk to him and say, now, look, brother, uh, you know, a little extreme here, all right? You know. Well, now, if you look at Paul's history, you begin to see, oh, okay, I, maybe it does make sense. He testifies about that in different places, like in Timothy. Where he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, he was a hit man for the Pharisees. Okay? For all practical purposes, he was a, a church gangster. You know? He went at night and knocked people off. Okay? Men and women, he dragged out, you know? He had no scruples. But he says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
He talks about it to the Corinthians. He says, last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He talked about in Galatians when he wrote those folks. He said, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. How I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Or as my wife and I might say, tried to kill it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age. And was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Okay, now it's starting to make sense, isn't it? No wonder he feels the way he does. He understood to use the, the, the words of our the, the marriage, marriage conf conference this, this weekend over at Northside, he understood the depths of his mess. He understood the depths of his sin. Just how wrong he was. And yet God extended grace to him and brought him to himself and gave him a whole new redemptive future. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. What do we see behind this grace? That he was deeply loved by God in spite of what God knew about him. Yes. Yes. You know, it's one thing to be deeply loved. It's another thing to be deeply loved after folks find out how you are. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay? That's a different ballgame. That's the kind of love he experienced from God through Christ. No wonder he has the attitude he has. He was known and loved. And this love included knowing his frame, Psalms 103. That knowing that he was but dust and not dealing with him according to the grievousness of his sins, but according to a plan that God had eternally established, as he said in Galatians, from his birth. Wow! No wonder to live as Christ and to die as gain. Who wouldn't want to do that if somebody knew you and loved you That's right. and then poured grace out upon you? Of course that's going to transform everything about you. Your whole orientation is going to change. Can you imagine what would have happened to the rich young ruler if he had known that? Man, he'd have chunked all that gold and silver it's trash. Of course, he would do it to, to benefit the poor. But for his own life, there was no comparison. But he never knew that. He, he, he never knew it. This love, on top of everything else, being known, was best expressed by God through Jesus' death for him so that he could receive grace. <laughs> so on top of everything else, Jesus did what, Jesus did what you can't do anything, no, how do you, there's no greater way to, sh to show your love than to give your life for somebody. Yeah, yeah. Now you can either give yourself, give your life for somebody in life, or you can just give it, period. And Jesus gave it, period. There's like nothing else he could have done to demonstrate his love for Paul or for us. No wonder for him to live as Christ and to die is gain. 
His gratitude is like very obvious. So you might ask you, you, you may ask yourself, well, you know, how do I, I don't feel that way, I don't, what's, what's up? And, you know, how do I know I'm a mess? Well, let's start with, there's, there's aspects of us that is, that are a mess that are not obvious to the naked eye, okay? Colossians helps us with that. We are alienated from God. We are enemies in our minds of God. We are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are uncircumcised in heart. We stand accused before the law of God. And we're under the power of Satan. Now that is a, from heaven standards, that is a mess. Okay? That is us. That be us. Now you can't see alienation from God. You know. You, you, you don't know that you're an enemy of God in your head. You know. Uncircumcised in heart. What's that? You know. But it's real. You see, that's why God has to re reveal himself to us. Because left to ourselves, will we figure that out? Of course not. There's no way we'd figure that out. It's like, huh, really? You know. <laughs> but he reveals it to us. So then we know, oh, I guess I am a mess. Then the question becomes, well, how does my mess show up? Now that's the part we do see. So Paul's mess showed up as a persecutor of the church. All right? My little secret. My mess shows up in a Pharisee kind of a thing. You know, I thank God I'm not like other men. You know, I have never been high in my life. I have never been to jail. You know, the band plays on. And, and guess what? The Pharisee does not leave that scene of prayer justified. Okay? <laughs> that, that, that'd be me. All right? And the day came when I had to really, really, really come to grips with that. That is. That brings me to three scenarios that hinder us from being able to experience what it means to be a mess and yet deeply known and loved. And for that to to trigger an out, outpouring of grace that just shifts the center of our life to Christ. One of those scenarios is we may see that we're a mess, but we don't know we're loved. All right? Yeah, I know I'm a mess, but he don't love me. And I really don't want God to know. Now, he does. But we just sort of like wish we could kind of hide it from him. So, you know what we'll do? We'll spend our lives trying to fix it or pay for it on our own. Okay? As a result, God becomes this distant judge before whom we must satisfy him before we're ever going to we're ever gonna be accepted. Now, if we're deceived into thinking that we've made it, then we will reek with self-righteousness. Because that's what that is. You know, I put my righteousness on the table and say, God, this is good enough, ain't it? I mean, it's not. <clears throat> but if we're deceived, we may think that it is. The Pharisees thought so. That's why the Sermon on the Mount is like it is. You know, oh, I, you know, Jesus would tell these guys, yeah, I know you guys, you know, are not supposed to commit adultery. And all y'all say, yeah, man, we don't commit adultery. We ain't never done it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Question, have you ever lusted after a woman? <gasps> you know, Jesus was trying to show them, no, you didn't make it. You thought you had, but you hadn't. The other one is if you feel you can never please him, then you will sink in despair. Some of you in this room probably had a parent you could not please. So you know really truly what that feels like. That's what, the, that's what you feel when you don't think you will ever be able to please God. 
and you just give up in despair. So that keeps you from experiencing what Paul experienced. Now scenario two is we see his love but not our mess. In this situation, you will continue to do your mess because you don't think it matters. And we claim, you know, and I, I, you run into these people. They love God. Oh, I'm on y'all not shot on both on sea dog, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they living like the devil. You know, it's like, how do you do that? You know. You know, how many times have I walked up to somebody at a rescue mission or a homeless meal? Oh, I feel Jesus in my heart. Therefore, preacher, you ain't got to try to lead me to Christ. I'm already there. You know, then he starts talking about all the stuff he's doing. You know, I can still remember this dude on the street walked up to me and this other guy and said, I've been baptized. Now, he was selling something hot. Okay? Translation. He stole it and he's going to resell it. And he's going to do it to us. And then this guy says, oh, well, this, by the way, this is a preacher. First thing out of his mouth after he said that, I've been baptized. You know. Now, I, 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 like, I forget exactly what I said because it wasn't too long after that that he left. Okay? <laughs> Again, yeah, we're not getting into this conversation. You know, you see it. That's somebody who, who thinks he's loved. He sees the love, but you know, he's still in his mess and continue down the road. Then this means that God becomes a subjective experience, but not an objectively lived holy lifestyle. Subjective experience, yes, but not an objectively lived life. Then there's scenario three. We don't see our mess and we don't see his love. Somebody said it in, in Bible study last past Wednesday. You know, he who, who dies with the most toys wins. You know, now that's a crass way of putting it. But it's a person who's pretty much focused on their earthly life. And if God, if you can, can help me with that, or add to it, I'm down. But if you can't do that, it's been nice knowing you. And, and they move on. The rich young ruler, in very real sense, wanted to add God to what he already had. Sincerely. I mean, he wasn't trying to play act. He really did want to know how to inherit eternal life on top of everything else. You know, I'm rich. I got everything I want. The only thing I don't have is eternal life. What do I have to do to get that? What do I got to do? Nail that down. I'm good. He didn't know that required an exchange, which he wasn't ready for. It. He was caught in scenario three. So the central concerns of somebody caught in that situation is how do I make my life work? Or how do I maximize my well-being? Do you realize how many self-help books there are on the shelves today? Or on the online, whatever you call it? To help you make life work or maximize your well-being. Or in some cases it's stated, maximize your potential. Not interested in dealing with my mess or dealing with the reality of God's love. Of course, we fail to realize what we read earlier, that all things earthly are temporal. Something else we talked about in Bible study on Wednesday. When you die, you leave it all behind. You know what happens in Egypt, right? You pack everything in the coffin and bury it with the person. And if you open that coffin up a thousand years later, guess what? The toys are still there. <laughs> they didn't go nowhere. You will leave it behind. Paul says, naked you came here and naked you going out. Period. You ain't coming and going any other way. I'm telling you. 
Now, does that mean that God doesn't care about this life? No. Your father knoweth that you have need of these things. You know, food, clothing, shelter. He gets it. But what does he say? Seek above all things the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Paul says it well in 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all. Therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's just another way of saying to live, in, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hallelujah. So as I bring this on home now, to summarize, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether you're living life in the context of ministry, career, at home, in your marriage, being single, with the kids, or hanging out. In all these different contexts, we live with the central guiding system, gyroscope, our reason for being, the compass, the north star of Christ. He is what makes, guides us, rules us, however you want to say it. He is our all in all. Again, what makes this happen? We realize that we are a mess, but we are deeply known and yet deeply loved by God. And our whole world will turn upside down when that hits you. It certainly did with Paul. That love is so powerful. That grace is so transforming that as he said in Corinthians, it will constrain you to make Christ your all in all. It really does make sense. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you know that this world is always vying for our hearts. It would be wonderful if we could say you are our all in all once and for all. But as we live and breathe, something comes along that says, no, 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 no. Make me your all in all. And the next thing you know, we're, 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 we're straying off the path. Lord, awake us, awaken us for the, at those moments. And pull us back, Lord, that you might continue to be the all in all that you were intended to be in our lives. You said that no one is worthy of you who's not willing to leave all for your sake. And no wonder, as we look at what went down with Paul, Yes, it makes sense. As we recognize the temporalness of this world, yes, it makes sense. But Lord, you know that we are prone to wander. Prone to leave the Lord we love. Lord, we, we, we plead with you together. Come and get us when we stray. And deepen our understanding and grasp on what it means to be so deeply known and deeply loved that it makes no sense not to make you all in all. In Jesus' name, amen.